Welcome everyone to the Computational Genetics Discussion Group. Today we have Dr. Esther Allen from Barnegie University talking about utili utilizing, utilizing uh, genetic variation in insect populations. Dr. Esther Allen is a senior research leader at Varnigin Livestock Research. She has a bachelor in tropical ag agriculture, master in animal breeding and epidemiology, and PhD in animal breeding and genomics. Thank you, Esther, and uh, you have the word. So thank you for inviting me for this uh, seminar. It's really nice uh, to get this opportunity. Um, so um, I already have been introduced, but in the, in the next few slides, I would like to give you a, a small introduction about myself, um, where I'm working and, and the projects that I'm involved in. Uh, Esther? Uh, yes. if, if, if you're okay, I can uh, interrupt you if we have any question in the chat. Yes. Is that fine yes. for you? Yes. Okay. So okay. if you have questions or if you need some clarification, then please interrupt. Uh, I don't know if I'm, I never work with Zoom, so, but I think you can raise your hand or you can use the, the chat. Uh, and, and otherwise, you can interrupt me. Uh, so, yes, uh, I, I think it's nice to have an, uh, a nice discussion. So, uh, Yes, please ask questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, uh, I'm a researcher at the Animal Breeding and Genomics of Wageningen University and Research. Uh, and on the picture right, you can see uh, the campus of Wageningen University and Research. It's a really nice campus, but uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm still working home for already more than a year. Uh, but hopefully in, in some time period, we can work again on this uh, nice campus. Um, in two, 2009, I defended my PhD, uh, PhD, PhD thesis, which was focusing on social genetic effects in laying hands. And I continued working on this topic for quite some years as a postdoc in collaboration with Pieter Baiba. And since approximately two years, I started uh, working at Wageningen Livestock Research, which is also part of uh, Wageningen University and Research. And I'm now uh, kind of a senior researcher um, uh, and a project leader of uh, several different projects. And in this slide, I would like to give you an overview of all the projects that I'm involved in. Um, I'm working on uh, many different livestock species, but also on many different traits. And I think the uh, most projects focus on using new technologies um, to define new phenotypes or to improve the phenotypes that are currently in a breeding program. Um, and these uh, phenotypes can be, for instance, um, activity, of, of broilers where we use uh, sensor technologies to uh, uh, monitor the individual activity of individual birds kept in, in larger groups. Um, uh, one of my PhD students is, is working on this uh, project, uh, but I'm also working uh, with organoids, which are tiny organs which are kept outside of the, uh, of the body, so it's an in vitro uh, model system, and we use these organoids to uh, as a phenotyping tool uh, to study complex traits like uh, feed efficiency or um, health related traits. But today I would like to give a presentation of um, um, insects breeding. Um, and I would like to give you an insight in, in the journey that started already, I think, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, eight years ago. Uh, and I would like to give you some background in this in this journey and why I started working with with insects. But before starting my presentation, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, um, because there are several people working on this uh, topic. Um, my colleagues from animal breeding and genomics, which are in the, the green part of this slide. Uh, my colleague Tone Feldkamp of animal nutrition. Uh, 
and my colleagues from the uh, laboratory of uh, genetics. So why insects? Uh, insects are very interesting uh, animals and um, they are quite important if you look at the protein transition. Uh, we see um, that uh, insect production is a booming industry. In, in the Netherlands, uh, we have, I think, around 20 companies or maybe even more that work on, on insect production. And, and what we see is that uh, insects can play a major role in, um, in the high quality protein sources. So the FAO stated that we should improve the uh, protein production uh, for both human and animals. Uh, and they also showed that there is a large food waste uh, in, in the world, uh, approximately 30%. And, and we foresee a major role uh, of insects helping uh, to upcycle uh, the waste streams in high quality protein sources. So we see that uh, insect projection is an is a growing market. It's really a booming market uh, with high economic potential. Uh, but we also see that upscaling uh, requires efficient production. And currently what we see is that the, the supply um, is not sufficient and that the demand is higher than the, the supply. And so uh, we need tools um, to increase the insect production and uh, we also need tools to have an efficient and healthy um, uh, increase in the production. And we think that breeding can play an important role in this uh, improvement of the insect production. Uh, but what we see or what we noticed is that uh, breeding knowledge in the insect production is currently lacking. Uh, and uh, there are also several practical issues to uh, implement uh, the breeding knowledge in the current uh, insect production. So what we would like to do is um, develop a tailor-made breeding program um, that can be used to improve um, and uh, improve the current insect uh, or populations. Uh, and to improve them in an efficient and healthy way. And from livestock, we already know um, that genetic selection can have a substantial impact uh, on the traits that we are interested in. Um, and I think one of the famous examples is uh, published in, in Hafenstein, where they showed the um, the uh, improvement of uh, broiler growth. So they compared a strain of 1957 and a strain of 2001, and they, sh and they showed a huge improvement in, in the growth of these broilers. Uh, and this was mainly due to genetics. Um, this impact can also be seen in other livestock species, for instance, in cattle, um, uh, improving the milk production, uh, but we could also apply a genetic selection to improve the health and welfare of uh, livestock species. And what we would like to do is use this knowledge uh, in insect production. And in this presentation, I would like to show you uh, the potential of genetic variation in insect populations, but I would also show you the challenges uh, of setting up an uh, insect breeding program uh, and the impact that it can have uh, to use genetic selection in insect populations. So first, the potential of genetic variation. Uh, and for this, I would like to show you a study uh, that I performed during my postdoc period. Um, during my postdoc, I, I uh, worked on social genetic effects and we thought that it uh, might be interesting to use insects as a model organism um, to study social genetic effects. But in this presentation, I would only like to focus on um, the estimation of genetic parameters for life history traits in flower beetles, because that's also what we did in that uh, study. 
And the traits that we were interested in uh, were pupil body weight, uh, the development time from placing the parents together until uh, pupation, and the growth rate, which was defined as the uh, pupil body weight divided by the development time. And in this study, we used two populations, um, the Bhopal and the ring eye. Um, the Bhopal has uh, black eyes and, and the ring eye has uh, some uh, white eyes. And so uh, we were able to distinguish the, between the two populations. Um, we made a um, pedigree for the two populations. So we had two, uh, the, the two generations included in the pedigree. Uh, we used a single pair of mating. So one male was uh, mated with one female. And we had approximately 60 families per population. So to collect all the phenotypes, uh, we had thirteen groups. Yes. Sorry, Sorry I, I have a question regarding this uh, single pa pair matings. How hard yes. is is how hard is that for 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 beetles to to conduct the, this single pair matings? Because for some insects, this can be quite tricky, right? Yes. So and for some insects, they don't mate when they are kept in very small groups. But for flower beaters, it was possible. So I placed one male and one female together. And I marked the male so that I knew which one was the male. And, and I placed them together, I think, for 48 hours. Uh, and then the female was uh, laying the eggs. So for, for flower beetles, it is possible. But I know for some insect species, it is not. Um, uh, did yes. you mark by painting them? Or yes, how, I, yeah, I paint? used the nail, yes, nail point polish uh, I used uh, uh, to paint them, uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, but uh, it's a good question and, and later on in the challenges, uh, I will come, come back to that as well, uh, yes. Um, so we had uh, to collect the phenotypes, we, um, and the, we split the experiment in, in different blocks. So we had 13 blocks and, and every two weeks a new block started. And in each block we had 48 trials. Uh, and in each trial uh, we placed 10 larvae, five full sips of one population and five full sips of the other population. And, and in the picture you can see a block and, and the files. So this is uh, how they were, were kept. And at, at the end of the experiment, we had almost 6,000 individuals with individual phenotypes. So a phenotype for body weight and uh, development time. And, and based on that, we could uh, calculate the growth rate. Uh, and we had approximately 45 offspring per family. So this is an overview of the uh, descriptive statistics. Um, so here you can see the two populations and uh, the different traits. Um, the average body weight was uh, 2.3 uh, milligram. Um, the average development time was uh, approximately 27 days. Uh, and the uh, growth weight was uh, almost 90 uh, microgram. Uh, and what we found was that females uh, developed slower and had a large, larger body weight. And, and this is quite common in, in several insect species. We used a uh, linear animal, animal model to estimate the uh, genetic parameters. Um, so we used, uh, so the and the Y variable or the dependent variable was uh, either uh, body weight, uh, development time, or, or growth rate. And um, the fixed effects were um, the, the block, um, the, the gender, um, the population, and then the social sex effect. Um, we had a random genetic effect and a random group effect, or in, in poultry, we call it cage effect, where a random file effect. Um, and we had the residual.
So the results of the heritability, um, here you can see the, the heritability for the two populations combined, but I also estimated the heritability for both the populations uh, separate. Uh, and for body weight, you can see that the heritability ranges between 0.36 and 0.40, which is also quite common in, in, in livestock species. So it's a, a moderate heritability for body weight. For development time, we noticed that the heritability ranged between 0.10 and 0.58. And this is, a, yes? Uh, sorry, uh, we have a question regarding the, the statistical model. Uh, Chav yes. is asking why cage can be considered as random effect rather than fixed. Yes, that's a, a bit of an, an yeah, it, it, I know that there is some discussion about including um, a cage or a group as a random or as an, an a fixed effect. In, in my case, we have many um, groups. So then if you include it as a fixed effect, then it will take quite some degrees of freedom of your model. Uh, and we were also interested in this uh, random group effect because it can tell you um, uh, it give you, can give you a direction of the uh, social genetic effects. Um, and in this presentation, I will not um, um, give the results of the social genetic effects because I think uh, that's a bit out of the scope of this presentation, but um, still uh, it's important to include it in, in the model. I hope this answers uh, the question. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Um, so the, um, the heritability for um, development time was quite different between the two populations. Um, and we, we are not sure what the reason is, but we think that it might be because of a bottleneck in the, in the, in the, in the ring eye. So in, the, the, in, in, in this case, the orange population. And the heritability for growth rate uh, ranged between uh, 0.34 and 0.59. So overall, you can see that there's quite a, a moderate heritability, uh, which gives some indications that there is a potential for genetic selection and, and, that, and, and that we can use genetics to improve um, the traits that are important for um, flower beetles. But it's also important to, to estimate the genetic correlations because based on the genetic correlations, we could see if there is a trade-off between uh, some traits. Um, and the genetic correlations are also important in, in a breeding program because if genetic correlations are unfavorable, um, then when you select for one uh, trait, then this will have a, a negative effect on the other trait. So we estimated uh, uh, the genetic correlations for the three different traits. And in green, you can see the, the genetic correlations. Um, so the, um, there was a, uh, when we found that when um, development time increased and then body weight also increased. And so this is a positive uh, correlation. And uh, for um, insect producers, this, this is not uh, favorable, uh, but as you can see, the standard error is quite large. Um, so not, so this genetic correlation is not significant. Um, for um, growth rate and uh, body weight, we also found a positive genetic correlation. Um, so meaning that the uh, growth rate is higher than the body weight is also, or pupa body weight is also higher. Um, and we found a negative genetic correlation between growth rate and development time. If we then look at the uh, phenotypic correlations, then these are in the same direction as the uh, genetic correlations and are also comparable with, with literature, what we found. So um, um, in, in the beginning of my presentation, I, I mentioned that I would like to focus on, on three subjects. And uh, the first one is the potential. Um, and, and with this experiment, we can 
see that there is a potential of genetic variation in insect populations, at least in flower beetles. Um, so there's a substantial genetic variation. Um, and this means that there is some potential to improve the traits of, of importance. Um, but I also show that it is important to know the genetic parameters because we found quite some differences between the two populations. Uh, and so it is important to know what the genetic parameters of your po population will be um, before you start selecting uh, in your population. Uh, and also it's important to know the uh, genetic correlation of the, the different traits. So now I would like to continue with the challenges because um, um, so I show that we are able to estimate genetic parameters, uh, at least for the flower beetles, uh, but there are still some challenges when setting up a breeding program. And this is a design of a, a breeding program, which is often used. Um, so as you can see, uh, a breeding program consists of, of several steps or activities, and it's a kind of a, a, a circular uh, design. Um, so you always start with um, uh, uh, defining your, your breeding program, and you always start, or you always end with evaluating um, your breeding goal and, and see if you make the right decisions or that you should improve something or change something in the next generation. Uh, I'm not going through all these steps, uh, but I would like to highlight some of the challenges that we currently see uh, when uh, we are thinking of a breeding program in, in insect production. And one of the challenges is the, is the production system. Uh, because the production in the production system, so in, in commercial situations, uh, insects are kept in very, very large groups. Um, and it's very difficult to identify individual, uh, individuals in these large groups. Um, but you can also imagine that there are quite some differences between the, the production system uh, and uh, the selection environment. So this production system determines which traits are important in your breeding goal. Um, and it really depends on, on the environment of the production system, uh, which traits you would like to include in your breeding goal. Uh, in some production systems, feed efficiency might be important because they use a quite expensive nutrient, whereas in other systems, they maybe use uh, waste streams and then feed efficiency is maybe less important to select. And in, in your breeding goal, you can also um, so you include the traits that are important for your uh, population or the traits that you would like to improve, uh, but you can also um, uh, include, some, uh, include some emphasis on your traits that you would like to improve. So which traits would we like to collect? So which kind of information would we like to collect? Um, so in livestock, we often collect individual phenotypes. With an insect, it, this is a challenge uh, because I already mentioned that identification is, is difficult. Um, uh, it's also time consuming to collect all the individual phenotypes. Um, it, it would be nice if, if new technologies uh, will uh, be there in the future so that we could do some automatic uh, phenotyping. Uh, but it's also a challenge to link uh, the different phenotypes of one individual to each other. Because you can imagine, for instance, in, in flower beetles, that the larval stage consists of several stages. Um, so if you collect um, a phenotype in, in the early larval stage, uh, then it's not possible to link that to, for instance, the, the pupa, because you can't mark uh, the individuals through uh, life. It's also important to uh, collect uh, um, information on the family relationship. Uh, but here we also notice that there are some, um, some challenges. So again, identification. Um, and uh, we already mentioned that in, in the beginning of this presentation that in some insect species, it's difficult to keep the selection candidates separate. 
and to have single pair mating because the, those individuals prefer to mate in large groups and, and then it's difficult, uh, and it will have an effect on your fertility. But if we have this information, then we can estimate genetic parameters. And, and using this uh, genetic parameters, we can estimate breeding values. And, and we, of course, know uh, what trade-offs could be be between the different traits. Um, using this information, we can select um, the selection candidates. Um, and ideally, we, we would like to use genetic selection um, so that we can use the information also of, of relatives. Um, and that we can use uh, or estimate breeding values. Uh, but uh, in insects, it, it, it's also possible to use uh, phenotypic selection or that's, um, and, and then we select based on, on performance. So these are the, uh, the, the challenges that we currently foresee. Uh, and I thought, I'm not sure if it's working, but I thought maybe you have some other ideas of, of challenges, or, or maybe you already know some challenges which are um, in, in the insect uh, prediction or when designing a breeding program. So I'm not sure if this is working, otherwise I continue with my presentation, but if you have some suggest suggestions, then uh, yes, you can let me know. Uh, should we add in this challenge the genotyping of individuals uh, Yes, as well? Yeah, we had some discussions about the genotyping in, in insects because um, in, um, the generation interval is quite short. Um, so the question if, is if you would like to use um, genotyping to um, uh, shorten generation interval, but it might be, of course, um, identifying the individuals might help if you use the genotyping. But the problem with genotyping is that uh, probably you need the whole individual. Um, so not like in, in livestock where you can collect a, a, uh, an, a blood sample or collect an, an hair tissue. Um, that's uh, still a bit problematic in, in insects. Yeah, uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, yes. Eva, Eva asked, any chance of generating and incorporating any genomic information? Mm. Yeah, I think so. The, uh, that might be a possibility. Uh, we, we haven't looked into that yet, but uh, yeah, it, it really depends on, on the question and, and it really depends on uh, what you would like to do with the genomic information. Um, Gregor has a, a question as well. Uh, what is the public perception about eating insects in the Netherlands? Yes, so um, there is some, um, um, there is a possibility to buy um, products from insects, um, but it's not common yet. Um, I, I don't know um, the, the public uh, opinion, uh, but I think it's still, it's, it's just not common in, in the Netherlands, uh, but, it, but it is changing. So regulation is changing. Uh, we also see um, in, in Europe that, uh, for instance, uh, until recently, it was only allowed to give uh, living um, insects to um, uh, uh, poultry, and, and that's also changing. So I think in the coming year, there, there will be some changes in, in regulation, and, and probably that will help in, in making it more common. Okay, another question from Kelly. Uh, what are the important traits, egg production versus growth rate? What about progeny testing, family selection? Yeah, so in important traits, that's a good question. I think um, um, so. It, it really depends on the on on the um, on the insect producer. I think, um, um, and in my next few slides, I will uh, I will I will give some details about one trait that we were 
uh, interested in, and that's uh, body mass over a certain period. Um, so then you improve both development time and, and uh, body weight. Um, I think fertility, um, survival, um, there's still quite some uh, mortality in the different phases. Um, but I think also health related traits uh, are important. And the next question you mentioned about. Yeah, it's oh, about testing family selection. What yeah, about so that? I think um, currently family selection would be um, interesting because then you can keep the SIPs together and, and select based on, uh, for instance, an, an average value of the, uh, of the SIPs. Um, progeny testing is, is more complicated because then you um, need to um, yeah, identify them for a longer period and then use the information back to the, to the parents. Um, so I think that's more complicated, but we have to look into that. Uh, Julian asked uh, two questions. Uh, the first one was how to determine relationships between individuals if insects kept in groups cage. And a relate, related question is, would it be possible to determine breeding values for cages rather than individuals? Yeah, so in, in my case, it, it was not possible because I had two um, uh, populations in, in one page or in one file, but I think it, it is possible. And then you could have like a kind of a, a family. So you have, um, um, so in pool three, we also use uh, pool records of a, of a group, for instance, egg production, and you can um, estimate breeding values for that. So I think that's possible. Um, oh, the first question, sorry. Um, uh, the first question was how to determine relationships between individuals if the insect kept in group cages. Yes. So in, in my case, when I use flower beetles, I, I knew which sire and them I used, and then I could relate um, um, the offspring. And I also knew uh, which grandparents I used. And, and, and so I knew which ones were the sips and which one were, for instance, uh, half sips uh, from each other. Um, but then uh, you need to keep them individually um, and, and follow them during a certain time. Okay. Uh, Lereza asked, uh, how is the food competition between mealworms me and other livestock just as chickens? Yeah, so uh, I think there is some, uh, some food competition and, and that's why we were also interested in, in the uh, indirect or, or social genetic effects in, in, in flower beetles because there is some competition between um, individuals. Yes. Uh, we have another question from Jana. Uh, does the density of the insects affect the performance? Is there some so social or other components affecting them? Yes, I think so. So um, I think it's, uh, um, I, I think there ha has been some studies that looked at the density um, in, in groups and, and it's an important uh, um, factor which will have an effect on your um, performance, yes. Uh, Robert, uh, he asked as well, uh, how difficult is, is it to manipulate the breeding cycle of these insects for stable production? For example, in Uganda, they have been trying to breed grasshoppers for a while, but, but they, they have not succeeded Succeeded, succeeded because they are se seasonal breeders in swarms. Yes, I think that really depends on the on the insects. Um, so you can influence the um, uh, the life cycle um, using um, uh, changing the temperature and the humidity. At least that was in, in flower beetles. Um, I think that really depends on the insect species, what you can do. And, and therefore, I think it's important to develop a, a kind of a tailor-made breeding program for each different insect species, because there's quite some differences in, in the way they live and, and what they need. 
Thank you. Very good discussion. Uh, for now, we are done with questions. Uh, thank you. Yes, very much. so I will, I will continue with the final part of my presentation. Um, So the final part of my presentation focuses on the impact of genetic selection. And, and to show you the impact of genetic selection, uh, we performed a simulation study. Uh, we are still working on the simulation study. So I, I would like to show you the first results, but there are still quite some questions uh, that we didn't answer yet. Um, for the simulation study, we used cell action um, and we compared or simulated three scenarios. Uh, the first scenario, uh, we used phenotypic selection on uh, development time. Uh, in the second scenario, we used uh, genetic selection using a uh, blob on um, development time. And in the third scenario, we used, um, we included two traits, um, development time and, and body weight. And in the simulation study, we were, uh, or the objective was to increase the, the total amount of body mass that is produced in a specific period of time. And, and body mass is defined as the um, body weight um, divided by the development time, uh, times uh, 365. So we were interested in, in the body mass per year per animal. Um, and, and the baseline, uh, in, in the population that we uh, simulated was uh, 31 uh, milligram of body mass per year per animal. And we were interested if we, if we use phenotypic selection or genetic selection, if we could increase um, this uh, body mass per year. So first the results of uh, phenotypic selection. Um, so using phenotypic selection, we selected on, on development time and, and we, uh, uh, the aim was to reduce uh, development time. So here you can see that if we apply phenotypic selection and then we can see a reduction in, in development time, but we can also see that there is a, a small reduction in, in body weight. But um, overall, we can see that there is an increase in, in, in the body mass per year of 5%. Uh, if we use genetic selection only on development time, and then we can also see that we can improve um, development time uh, with minus uh, 1.7 days. Uh, when we only select on um, development time, um, then we see that there is a reduction in, in body weight uh, but we see that in the end, we can improve uh, the body mass per year uh, with 6%. And if we have an index of um, body weight and um, development time, so if we combine the two traits in, in, in the genetic selection or in the, um, it's called an, an index, um, then we can see that we can improve uh, both development time and uh, body weight. Uh, and, and we can increase uh, the body mass per year at 9%. Uh, it is important to, to uh, keep in mind that uh, the genetic correlations have a large effect on, on your response to selection. And, um, uh, in this case, the uh, genetic correlation uh, was positive between uh, body weight and, and development time, uh, which is not favorable in this case, uh, but it was a small genetic correlation of 0.2. Um, and if this you know, correlation would be larger, then it's more difficult to select on, on one trait and also select on the other trait. And, so, and therefore, it's important to know the uh, genetic correlations between uh, different traits. So currently we are looking at the impact of, uh, for instance, the mating design, uh, the family size, um, the also trade-offs. So uh, when we uh, have a different genetic correlation, what would that uh, have an effect on uh, your um, response to selection? Also the economic value of a trait. So um, 
when you put more emphasis on one trait and, and less emphasis on another trait. Uh, and of course, the inbreeding, uh, which is quite important in livestock. And we don't know if it's important in, in insect uh, populations. So uh, it's important to keep that also in mind. So uh, with this, I would like to uh, finalize this presentation. Uh, and in, in summary, um, and so um, I showed um, an, an experiment with flower beetles and, and we showed that there's a moderate heritabilities for the, the traits that uh, we were interested in. Uh, and this shows a potential for uh, genetic selection. Um, I also showed that it's important to know the uh, genetic parameters, although it is a challenge in insect uh, production to estimate those uh, genetic parameters, but it, it would really help um, in your breeding program. And, and there are some challenges uh, or some practical limitations when implementing a, a breeding program. So thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to uh, answer some more questions. Thank you very much for this great talk. Um, so we have a few more time for more questions. Uh, if, if anyone has any question, can you send on the chat or unmute yourself and ask. Um, Meanwhile, um, I would like to know, uh, you said about the index, um, how do you weight the, the traits? Did you use like a half and half weight? How, how you choose this weight for the index? So in, in this simulation we used, uh, I think it's half, half, um, but I'm also playing a bit with that. Um, so if we put more emphasis on one trait, what will happen with the other trait? Um, and it, it really depends, of course, on, on the, um, the, the company, uh, how much emphasis they would like to, to put on one trait. And, and of course, in, in, in my simulation study, I only use two traits. In, in real, you will have several traits. Uh, and, and so then, yeah, the, um, the emphasis will be different. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, Gregor asked, what's the next steps for, for this work? Yeah, so the, the next steps is, um, um, so we just started with the, with the simulation studies and, and so we would like to um, really look at the impact. And then what we would like to do is um, simulate, uh, for instance, uh, several generations to see uh, uh, what is happening. I, I think that will really help us, but also the, the insect producers to show, okay, what is the impact of uh, genetic selection? Perfect. Um, well, we do not have in, any other question in the chat. So I would like to thank you uh, one more time for this great uh, presentation. It was very interesting, particularly for me, that is uh, very interesting in this research. Um, yeah, we have one more question uh, from Kelly. Um, how, are, how are things going regarding sensors for automated phenotyping? Yes, I think that's an interesting one. Um, so in, in my... Um, and if, if I showed one of the first uh, slides, uh, all, the, all the projects that I'm involved in, and, and there we use new technologies to, to phenotype. And it, it would be really nice to, to use uh, a technology also in, in insects. And, and I know in, in the Netherlands, there, there is a company that is uh, working on, for instance, uh, monitoring behavior. Um, so it, it would be nice to see if there are some possibilities to uh, use um, technologies and, and phenotype them. Yeah. I think it will really help um, because then you can collect phenotypes on a larger scale than is uh, currently possible. Yeah, I think it will be the future, right? To yeah, automate so. this phenotyping process. <laughs> uh, Julian asked, uh, compared to phenotyping livestock species, is your work in insect more or less labor intensive? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so when I did my experiment, I found it very labor uh, intensive. So we were there every day for several months in, in the lab and, um, and, and checking the, the individuals. Um, but I think in, in livestock, it's, it's so now it's more and more getting automated. So for instance, uh, uh, milk production is, is collected. And uh, but if, if I look at my own work, then I often receive phenotypes from, from the breeding company and, and they of course collect the phenotypes. So for them, it's also labor intensive. So I think um, in, in insects, it's labor intensive because we don't have the technologies yet to um, automatic phenotype them. Um, they are very tiny, so it, it's very difficult to collect them. Um, that makes it labor intensive, um, I would say. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I think uh, we are good to go. Uh, thank you very much for this great talk. You're welcome. And if there are questions like in the coming days or something, then you can always send me an email. Uh, or if you are interested in, in one of the other projects, then uh, please send me an email and I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, and have uh, please, please, I would like to highlight everyone to, uh, to be aware of our CGDG Twitter uh, when we post some news of next talks, as well as our mail list as well. So that's all. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.